welcome to my Bob Thurman podcast. I'm so grateful some good friends enabled me to present them to you. If you enjoy them and find them useful, please think of becoming a member of Tibet House U.S. to help preserve Tibetan culture. Tibet House is the Dalai Lama's cultural center in America. All best wishes. Have a great day. This is episode four. Nargarjuna's teaching of evolutionary skill. Okay, I'm going to talk about Buddhist biology. This book is full of Buddhist biology, and you'd be surprised what I mean by that. At verse 7, he says, Having analyzed well all deeds of body, speech, and mind, those who realize what benefits self and others and always perform these are wise. That is, the deeds, good deeds, that means. If you understand, if you analytically understand all deeds of body, speech, and mind, you perform the good one. And that benefits self and other, right? So this is going to talk about ethics. Now, in Buddhist ethics is connected to Buddhist biology. By Buddha, originally, not just Mahayana. Karma, which means theory. Karma is a biological theory. It is not just fate. It is not just uh, some metaphysical or religious speculation. I mean, all scientific theories are in some sense speculation by their good scientists, or because they are none of them dogmas. But karma is a biological theory. And what kind of biological theory, what does a biological theory mean? Biology means the study of life. A biological theory means something that accounts for the differences of beings, the shape of their embodiment, the circumstances of their environment, uh, their, you know, you know, whether they're tigers or lions or insects or humans or whatever they are. Um, biology accounts for why they are what they are, right? Like Darwin, it's a genetic thing and related to the environment and the, the origin of species, survival of the fittest, et cetera, et cetera, right? There's this random mutations. You know, it's a, that's a biological theory. And it's one that explains the nature of different species in a, reason, in a ra- reason, rational causal way but with all totally materialistically, in the way at least it's neo-Darwinian, and I think Darwinian, that's, that's the idea. So there's no sort of soul in it, because he rebelled against the church and he didn't want to have a soul in it, right? Now, however, you could have a biological theory that would account for the different forms of life in a rational, causal way, and yet you could have a mental or a spiritual component in that. I mean, it's theoretical, right? I mean, you could say, well, prove that there is such a thing, fine. You can, and it can be challenged, but it is, that's what it is. It's such a theory. And, and by that theory, he therefore provides, it therefore provides a kind of uh, ethical, ethics and biology merge. And what, 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 is, what is interesting is this, the name for, the, for the, the Buddhist Ten Commandments, which are very similar to the Hindu ones. In fact, they are interconnected. And both, and the, which has a positive and a negative way of formulating. In other words, the ten don'ts and the ten do's, right? But the word dasha kushala karma pata. Pata means a path. Karma means action. But kushala we always translate as virtue. So the ten virtuous paths of action. And I would call it evolutionary action because it's the action that affects the shape of your life. Okay, and we know that action does affect the shape of our life. For, I mean, on the simplest example, you lift a weight, you go to the gym, you lift a weight every day, you know, six sets of 10 reps of a 20 pound weight and your muscle changes its shape and it becomes stronger. And your wrist and your forearms, but particularly the bicep for doing curls. Right? So that action changes the shape of your being. That's very simple. So in a way, it's, it's evolutionary. It, your, your arm evolves to be a stronger arm in a, in a different sort of local use of the word evolve. So, so 
the word kushala doesn't mean virtue, though. The moon kushala means skill. So literally what they are saying in Sanskrit is the ten skillful paths of action. And what, why would they call it skillful? What's skillful about it? Well, if you think that you are a conscious evolver and your deeds of, in your life as a being are shaping your existence in the future of this present life and in future lives, then when you do something that will give you an enhanced existence, you're being skillful. And when you do something that will give you a damaged existence, you're being unskillful, right? Just like if you drink too much, if you take some stupid drug, if you eat some bad food, you're going to be, get sick. That then you unskillfully ate that bad diet. All right, and if you're skillful, you don't do that, and you're careful about this, and you eat organic, and etc., and you leave the United States and go to the south of France and grow your vegetables without herbicides and pesticides and whatever, and you and you eat decent food that doesn't give you illness, and that's skillful. We can say that's skillful. So they call their very ethics skillful and unskillful. Now here's the thing: not killing, not stealing, forsaking the mates of others. Now that's right, killing, stealing, and adultery, like the same in the Ten Commandments, right, in the, in the West, West Asia. Hindu, the laws of Manu have the same thing, all right? Now, though, instead of calling this virtue and unvirtue, it's called skillful. And what's skillful about not killing? Well, what is the range that you're trying to evolve on? Your ultimate goal is to free yourself from suffering, to, to attain nirvana, to become a Buddha. And in non-dualistic teaching of Mahayana, to become a Buddha means you have to experience your, your oneness with all life. That's part of the, that is the realization. Emptiness means that you and all things are empty of any essence that separates you, and therefore you have a, your feeling of self-identification spreads over everything. So you identify with everything. Right? And, and, and apparently, according to their theory of evolution, that's the most blissful way of being. Because clearly, you're not afraid of anything, because you are everything, and you perceive it all as a, as a big bunch of bliss. Everybody else and everything else, right? So that's your goal, according to this. And the worst case analysis, the worst form of life is, a being that is completely isolated from every other thing. And how, when you really want to be, we don't want anything to impinge on you, what do you do? You put on layers of protection. You put on coats of armor. And in fact, they have a kind of hell where you're like all bound up inside a red hot iron ball. And therefore, of course, nobody's going to touch you with your red hot iron ball, but actually you're cooking inside this red hot iron ball. So you're in a state of misery, and yet you're completely apart from every other thing. So the worst way of being is to be completely fulfilling your delusory idea that you are separate from other things by reifying or building a structure around that sense of separateness that makes the barrier between you and the other things absolute, as, as absolute as you can. Of course, nothing relative will ever be absolute, but you're doing your best to make it so. Do you follow me? So you're completely alienated from everything else in a complete horrible condition. That's the worst possible form of being, right? And the greatest possible form of being is to be one with everything in a blissful way. Okay? Now, killing means you're reinforcing in yourself, subliminal, and in the field of your, of your existence interwoven with other beings, you're reinforcing the idea that that being that you killed is different from you. The life of that being is not your life. You destroyed it. It's not supposed to be in the world with you. You're going to eat it. You're going to kill it. You're going to use its skin for your shoes. You're going to whatever it is. You're going to do with it. Or you're getting it out of your way. You're afraid of it. So killing, therefore, builds the state of separateness. Short term, immediate thing, you'll get a shorter life. You know, that's just sort of tit for tat sort of thing. But, join again. but not from others. Right. But the, but, but the deeper skill thing you're reinforcing the separation. Similarly, when you take things from others that are not given to you, you're reinforcing your separate, you're disidentifying with them and their feeling of ownership. And you're annulling that and just taking their stuff. And then, you know, inappropriate sexuality is where you're kind of, sexuality is where you're most intimate with another being as a human, as a mammal. And then you're abusing that and causing harm by it. 
they say the mates of others because they're in a human society, but any kind of harmful sexuality will do as far as being unskillful. There you're in the, you're in a, sexuality is where there's a melting together and the most closest way of beings being together. And yet that you're using that in a harmful manner where you're emphasizing your separateness from that person by, by harming them, by injuring them in whatever form. So th th those are the unskillful things. The skillful ones are, you know, saving other lives. Because when you save a life, you are identifying with it. You're, you're, you're asserting its value. Giving gifts to others, so you're spreading your being to theirs and, and increasing their feeling of security and wealth and ownership. And then proper sexuality, where you're, you're finding, experiencing in a mutually benevolent way the union of self and other, at least with one person. Do you follow me? So in this way I'm saying, and then by doing those things, your, your biology shapes you to become a greater being, a more connected to others being. And the more and the kinder being and the more beautiful being, actually, you become ugly by killing. Then speech is a very important evolutionary thing because the way you in increase others with speech, and when you speak, you you speak. He he says divisive. Divisive means particularly slanderous, where you tell one person something bad about another person to divide them from each other in the, with the idea that then you'll be their best friend. You know what so-and-so said about you? Oh, they really think you're such a jerk and everything. You know, but I like you, you know. So then you're creating disharmony between them and to create, to create a false kind of harmony with yourself. And that kind of speech is considered very, very and again, unskillful. And uh, false with lying, of course. And lying is very unskillful because you're creating unreality instead of opening the door to reality for yourself and others, which is skillful because reality is bliss. You're creating more ignorance and, and, uh, and distortion and therefore more suffering, etc. Then finally, then the really horrible thing about it is even your thoughts. If you have negative thoughts in your mind, that's powerful negative evolutionary action, unskillful negative evolutionary action. You could, so you, you shouldn't kill in your mind. You shouldn't, if, if, when you see Saddam Hussein being brutally, you know, hanged by some Shiites who are mad with him, uh, then if you feel good, he deserved that, then that's really unfortunate because it's like you killed him. So you're necessarily grabbing some negative karma by killing him when he's already helpless, which is a bad idea. I mean, you know, to save lives of other beings, if he's killing them, then you, there, sometimes there can be, unfortunately, surgical violence that it was, diminishes violence. But that case is not. That was just sheer brutality. Therefore, you'll see later in this book, Nagarjuna forbids the king to do capital punishment two th almost 2,000 years ago. Bans capital punishment, which, which, uh, which a few hundred years before that in India, we know they were still doing. And after that, in other parts of India, they did do. But it's, he bans it. But what's, when I say the most horrible thing is that, therefore, in this kind of a culture where people feel to whatever degree, depending on how much they understand, that they are embedded in an evolutionary causal matrix so that everything they do, even everything they think, affects their shape of their being, present and future, then you have to become very attentive about your mind. Because if your mind is uncontrollably, you know, being violent, in violent fantasies or being, uh, you know, robbing or, or, be, or depriving other beings with, you know, wealth grabbing, you know, Gordon Gecko greed fantasies, or if your mind is, you know, committing uh, sexual harmfulness, harmful things in some fantasies, then the mind is generating that karma as if you're actually doing it. So then, since the unconscious mind is so powerful, you get into the enterprise that then we find so many centers in Buddhist countries and cultures, so many monasteries, so many century centers, people, meditation becomes a big deal. And not just meditation of just shutting the mind down, although that can be helpful sometimes, but meditation that critically penetrates into the deeper levels of motivation and thinking to prevent negative thinking. Because negative thinking is evolutionarily unskillful. Do you follow me? 
Whereas we have this false idea in the West because of our materialism, the mind doesn't really exist and it doesn't really affect what we do. So we're sort of whatever, you know, we'll watch whatever program, whatever, you know, look around, whatever thing. We're not careful about what we put our mind to. People will go, you know, I'll go this weekend and that weekend because it's just something mental. I'm not careful what I go study even, you know. I'll study anything because if my, anything I have in my mind will not be a big effect on my life because my mind is only an epiphenomenon of my brain. Unfortunately, we are a little bit like that. So this, I just wanted to do that, but Nagarjuna does that with the king. I think that's really very amazing, actually. One thing I used to meet a lot with Western scholars in human rights, kind of in Universal Declaration of Human Rights, human rights dialogues, you know, and the big puzzle to the Western people is, do the Buddhists had an idea of human rights? You know, do they have ethics? I was even told when I first was teaching 40 years ago in academia, Buddhists don't have ethics. I said, what? Well, I, you know, I, they can be nice, somebody said, but they don't have ethics. Well, why not? Well, because they don't have a self. Because they're selflessness. And to have a, ethics, you have to have a self that wants to do bad. Nice Protestant idea, you know, Puritan. This was in Massachusetts. You have to have a self that has all kind of wants to do bad, and you restrain it. That's what your ethic is. You tell it not to do it. But since you don't have a self, the Buddhist, I guess you just do whatever. And I said, that's holy cuckoo. What are you talking about? Of course they have a self, they have a relative self. They mean the self is not fixed, ultimately. So therefore, in fact, they have to do ethics to make, to shape the self. And I, I, have, I used to have so many of these conversations. And the thing is so ironic, the West, you know. Rousseau, right? 18th century, writes a man. You know, then eventually Eleanor Roosevelt, it took a lady, universal, she shoved it down the throat of all those World War II conquerors, you know, in the UN, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. She got some pastors out there to like some Protestant ministers to help her do it. And she put it into the UN, right? It wasn't Truman didn't do that. She did it. And even FDR had passed away. But she did that. And so they're declaring all these great things. And then what? The British Empire, genocide, the native people everywhere, conquering everybody, trampling on the Indians, trampling on every, the Egyptian, trampling and addicting the Chinese to opium, conquer everybody, kill them if they don't fit into the industrial war machine of the British Empire. And then we are following in the same pattern. So we have great human rights, but the problem is with the materialist worldview that everything is random mutation, that there's no purpose, no teleology or purpose to life, no more providence, no more God, even to try to scare the wits out of you to behave yourself, and, and no ultimate purpose. And also, if you really do bad, and you die and you're nothing, so there's no consequence of what you did, add that all up. And who's going to follow the Universal Declaration of Human Rights? It's a great declaration, but who's observing it? And why should they? Why, why is it skillful to follow the Universal Declaration of Human Rights? Do you follow me? There's a big gap there. Anyway, I used to point out to my colleagues in these debates that we would have, you have a great thing, but there's no sanctions for not doing it. There's laws. And even legal theories nowadays, they say, well, morality and laws are different. You can do immoral things that are legal because they don't have to fit together. They have all kinds of complicated ideas like that, which are actually not very good. This podcast is brought to you in part through the generous support of the Tibet House U.S. membership community and listeners like you. To learn more about becoming a Tibet House member, please visit tibethouse.us. To learn more about upcoming programs with Robert Thurman, please visit bobthurman.com. And for upcoming programs in the heart of the Catskills, Menla in Phoenicia, New York. Please visit menla.us.
weekly interstitial music provided by Tenzing Chogyal. All rights reserved.